I never know when it goes. <laughs> Welcome to the Second Line Show. I'm Nola Nash. Let's let the good times roll. <laughs> Welcome once again to the Second Line Show. I am your host, Nola Nash, and we are talking love stories today. Getting you ready for our Valentine's Day. If you have a Valentine, then perhaps these stories will hit home. If not, you're going to have a list of books you're going to want to get for Sunday. So we will get your Valentine to you one way or the other. If you are joining us in the live broadcast, go ahead and be putting those comments down in the chat. Um, here you go. Put those comments in there, questions along the way for the ladies on the show tonight. We'll get to as many of those as we can. And if we don't get to you, please don't feel bad. We will go back and check the comments in all of the places that we are broadcasting today, whether it is my Facebook page, NOLA's Second Line, The Right Review, or live on YouTube. Um, we'll go back. We'll take a look at those and answer the questions as we can. If you have not given StreamYard permission to use your profile, your Facebook profile, go ahead and drop your name in your comment as well so that we know who's joining us today. We do like to say hello. We know we often have lots of familiar friends who are joining us and we like to greet you properly. So if you're also watching the replay, go ahead and put those comments in. They do send me a notification and I'll go back and chat with you then as well. So let's get rolling. We are going to talk to our guest today, we have got some great folks with us. I am super excited to have these ladies here. We did have Darren Strauss for just a minute, but he's had to leave us for personal reasons. And we're wishing him well. And we will see him on another episode of the Second Line Show coming up soon, as soon as we are able to get him on. Because I do want to talk to him about his fantastic book, um, The Queen of Tuesday, about Miss Lucille Ball. So we want to talk about that one for sure. But we have got a great group of women here, and I'm so excited to welcome them to the show. Welcome, ladies. So glad you're here. Thank you for joining us on and spending some time on your Wednesday night with us here. Uh, Miranda and I had the privilege of doing the Quill and Ink podcast together not long ago, and we had the best time. It was so such a blast, y'all. If you ever get a chance to do an interview with Miranda, jump on it because it was a blast. It was, it was a kick. We had fun. I think we had just as much fun after the broadcast chatting as we did during the podcast. Oh, it was yeah. Great. oh yeah, for sure. I think it was like almost an hour after we ended. We were like chit chatting about life. I'm like, okay, I actually need to eat supper and probably go to bed now. Like, please. <laughs> it was so funny. We could talk oh, about yeah. everything from oh, yeah. doctors' of office visits to to the cold to South Africa. I mean, you never know. You <laughs> never know. No topic was left unturned that evening. I think you're exactly right about that. All right, so we are gonna go Brady Bunch style as we introduce, we always go this way. So we're gonna let Miss Margaret Locke introduce herself to you. Margaret, tell the folks anything you would like them to know. Me first, oh my goodness. You first. first very first thing I'm gonna say is I apologize for the background. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> COVID has, has evicted me from my office because my husband is a professor and teaches online. So he's in the nice space and I'm in the not so nice space. Um, I've also been away from the writer's world for a while, year or so, do some personal stuff. But I'm back and I'm so thrilled that, that Annie invited me today and that I'm getting to know Nola and everybody else here. I've written two series of books. The first one, I'll just... Well, I don't even know if you can see those. You gotta go back. Other way, other way. Other way. Other way. Other way. I'm, out of, I'm out of practice. No, I do uh, it too. <laughs> this <laughs> this is I do this every week. Love series, and each of these books has a little bit of a magical element to it. Uh, the first one, Man of Character, is the one that brought Annie and I together, and it's about a bookstore owner who figures out that the men she's dating are fictional characters that she created long ago. Oh. And the second two continue off that in a way with side characters, and these are time travels. So one is um, take somebody back to Regency England. That is, where am I? Matter of time. And a scandalous matter brings a Regency lady forward to uh, 21st century Virginia. So those are a lot of fun. And my second series, I only have two in it so far because I got derailed a little bit. But this is the book, The Demon Duke is the book that is my USA Today bestseller and was a Rita finalist, so that's pretty cool. It's about a Duke with Tourette syndrome that I wrote in honor of my son who has Tourette syndrome. So 
And next up, the last one I have right now is the Legendary Duke, which is kind of a retelling of the Arthurian legend of Gawain and the Green Knight. So, yes. and he said, bring them all, talk about them. Yes. So, um, I'm really thrilled to be here tonight and a little bit nervous. So thanks for making me go first. <laughs> <laughs> we had to break the ice. Yeah, I mean, true. we're going we're, we're gonna to just throw you in uh, all the way. <laughs> we're going to ease you and you don't get to ease in at all. No, no, I don't have to, long. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, you're fine. You did a great job. So I am really looking forward to reading Margaret's books because I am a huge fan of Regency romance. Um, I grew up reading Georgette Heyer books mm -hmm. and all of those were huge favorites of mine. Sylvester, the Dauphin. I mean, these were like, I read them over and over and over again. <laughs> I don't think there's a Georgette Heyer I have not read. Um, most of high school. <laughs> was, there was one of those in, in my backpack all the time. So I'm really excited to get to discover your books because they are right up my alley, <laughs> as are all of these books sitting. You guys have got some great stuff. As, as I was reading, you know, I, I unlike Annie, I don't get to read all of the books before we come on the show. So I get to talk to you kind of, you know, Larry King style, where I get to ask the questions that are not book related. You know, there's kind of random <laughs> questions. We talk about that kind of stuff. Um, so I can't sit and talk plot with you. I haven't read them, but I do go through and I read all the synopsis and everything I can find. And I was having the best time getting to know these books and these stories. I don't typically get a chance to read a lot of romance. And I'm thinking, you know what? It's time to start bringing those back into my life because these were just calling my name. So many of them. And, you know, I'd really kind of forgotten how far away from the Georgette higher I'd gone. You know, it's like, God, that was like, I loved that stuff. Why have I put it so far away? So you're opening doors for me <laughs> to go back into the romance world. And I'm excited about it. I really am. All right. So coming up next, continuing around our circle is Tam Sam. I'm reversing letters. Tam Sachita is what we would be. No, Sam <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get it right here in just a minute. All right. Lady, tell us everything you want to tell us. Hi, my name is Sam Cheetah, and I don't have a good background either. I mean, <laughs> I don't think anyone, nobody is in a good room anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I miss all my kids are downstairs watching television, hopefully for the whole show, and I'm hiding. <laughs> I have this letter blocking the worst of the background, but <laughs> with a lot of laundry and some other junk on a table behind me. Um, it's but, real life here yeah, on the second yeah, line. So. Real life is happening everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But I wrote a series, Who Am I? that just came out when it came out uh, last month. Mm -hmm. And uh, this month, last month, January 12th. Mm -hmm. um, it's all, you know, time soup. I don't know. <laughs> time is relative in the time of COVID. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yes. I wrote the this though. Is it? And it came out last month. And um, it's about uh, a woman named Mia who wakes up in an LA hospital and she's wearing like a fancy designer gown and a tiara, but she has no memory. Mm -hmm. And she has no friends. She's there by herself. All she has is her phone. And she has to put her um, identity back together through her um, wow. Instagram posts. I love that. But what a great That's idea. Awesome. I mean, a real millennials version of the, you know, who am I? You know, where did I, what happened? Where did I come from? I and mean, all of those stories, there's so many of those stories out there, yeah. but what a great millennials twist on that story. I love that. Yeah, what a great idea. So. It I sounds so much fun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tracking back through your Instagram. And I was thinking as I was reading that, I'm going, would my Instagram actually tell me who I was? No, <laughs> like, I don't think anyone It does. would tell me I had a really cute dog, but I'm not <laughs> sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would yeah. actually lead me anywhere I needed to go. It's like, wow, maybe I need to <laughs> revisit yeah. one of those on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> Just in case. Yeah. That's Mia. Mia in the book is like, you know, she's basically a con artist. So, um, she, she's putting her, her, she's putting her, she's putting her identity together from. Oh, so it may or may not be her may or may not real be self. Like, yeah. Ah, and isn't that true of so many of us on, on social yeah, media? So all, many people, yeah. you you put what you want out there, but it's not necessarily yeah. who you are. I know. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I had to do a you know a bunch of blog posts when the book came out, and one of them I was supposed to introduce five facts about myself. So I thought I'd be cute and just use five Instagram posts and like just share things about myself, like I did with the, in the book. And I was like, I don't, I couldn't find five post that <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh yeah. 
<laughs> Mine would be more like, here's five things I like to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and here's five different places in my house my dog was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. not going to be about me at all. You're going to no. learn very little <laughs> real information about me. <laughs> exactly. All right. So we're going to go over and down to, well, over and down to Miranda. We're just going to go big circle. We're going to make a big circle here. So Miranda, you are on deck, my love. Hello, hello. I am the author of the Chin Up Tits Out series. So it's a contemporary <laughs> chiclet series. It's a three part series. And I don't have my books with me because they have all been lent out because, you know, COVID and, and Valentine's Day. I'm like, oh, you're alone <laughs> here. Let me just give this book to you, but drink while you read it because it's going to make you feel better. Like, yes. Um, so if you want to check it out, always remember chin up and tits out really like hold your head held high and your shoulders held back stand up tall and proud even in the worst of moments and so this series like i said is a three-part series we meet a young woman in her 20s who fell in love with a boy with an accent and i mean like let's think about the first crush that we had that either sounded or looked a little different than us and we usually fall head over heels and that was what this whole love story is all about is falling head over heels and face over backside into life <laughs> and trying to figure out what, you know, what balance is balance. And then they migrate into a pretty tough situation. I absolutely love writing about tough situations and taboo situations, stuff that we need to keep hush hush or feel that we need to keep hush hush. So I talk about racism. I talk about corrupted government. I talk about cancer, mental illness, abuse. There's a lot of stuff that I talk about that's tough to go through, but yet always having this chin up tits out attitude. And, you know, <laughs> oh, it's tough sometimes to find the silver lining in the darkest of corners. But if you choose to kind of strive to that, then and, you know, pick up yourself a good hearty adult beverage or a beverage of your choice, whatever, no judgment <laughs> either way, um, then life is actually a little bit less stressful like look at the last year that we've all had it has been stressful a lot of us have been stuck at home or stuck in situations that are tough and uncomfortable but if we always try to find a silver lining then you know when we look back on it we're going to remember that silver lining we're not going to remember potentially the uncomfortableness or the ugginess or grossness of of whatever looking back on so the that ugginess. is my suit yeah the ugginess yeah it's a new word <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm gonna use that right i came up with it yesterday i was like oh i like this like <laughs> okay yes. this is good <laughs> i like to make up my own words there should be a vocabulary <laughs> or a dictionary of miranda oh it should be my next book <laughs> we're gonna file it right next to shakespeare and dr seuss <laughs> oh yes right in between it will fit beautifully <laughs> my students like to keep a list of the weird things that i say during homeroom and it's like the nash 2021 saying this morning it was nut it was nut balls i said that <laughs> Totally was being a nutball. Oh, okay. They were like nutball. <laughs> are you in the bathroom? No, I'm online, but we have our homeroom on on Zoom and I was talking about the dog. He was just going crazy. He's just been such a nutball today. They were like nutball. <laughs> That's 2019, Boom. 2021. I'm like, oh, maybe I should. Well, I use nutball. that word. Isn't that a word? I've used that before. I mean, it's not ball. Oh, yeah, I was like this, but I guess they had never it's heard it before. Ball. And I'm going. <laughs> That might make for some interesting parent-teacher conversations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's been a few things I'm going, all right, so, you know, I'm going to save this chat so that when your parents email me, it's like, I had a perfectly good reason for what they overheard. <laughs> You're lucky. I mean, if you say anything coherent, I think it's great right now. I was talking to my daughter's <laughs> English teacher because my daughter is failing everything currently. Um, but um I made had a conference with her English teacher, and she said that she's just teaching um, to black boxes. Yeah, Everybody that's what I've got their, mostly. I mean, like, um, I can not imagine. Yeah. You just gotta be. Yeah. I would just like be blathering if I was <laughs> talking to. I kind of am. I kind of yeah. am. And the, and it, the eighth graders are funny. They don't want to turn their cameras on. You know, it's not like the little um, 
you know, elementary school kids, like the kindergartners, they're carrying their Chromebooks around the house. Mm -hmm. You've seen a full grand tour of wherever yep, it is that they live. <laughs> the eighth graders, I've got a couple of them that'll turn their cameras on in homeroom, but when they come to other Zoom lessons that they're not on there anymore. So it's a whole lot of black rectangles with little names in it. Yep. And they don't talk either. That's the other thing. They don't talk. They type it in the chat. So it's me talking to a chat box is <laughs> what they it. So awkward. What if you just let everybody go on with a little cat filter, like the, the lawyer? <laughs> a lot of hysterical. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things I have ever seen. And that. only because that's like my life. <laughs> like I totally felt that. It's like. So afraid that one day that would happen to me because I would be the one that would go, I don't know how to turn this filter off. <laughs> yeah. I can do so well. much with technology, but I wouldn't have stuck with yeah. the freaking cat. <laughs> <laughs> so what? It would have been so I don't know bad. how I kept a straight face. <laughs> the <laughs> judge, though, was the best, though, the way he was just so calm. Great <laughs> You just did that. It was the job. fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. There were so many elements of that that were just brilliant. <laughs> so it, was, it was amazing. It was, it was one of the best videos I've seen in a long And I think that the, that laugh, that it's just between the Bernie memes and the, the lawyer cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is like, we're finally starting to find our sense of humor again. It's fabulous. I'm loving it. <laughs> All right, Carol, we're coming over to you. I'm going to let you introduce yourself to the folks. Go for it. No way. Yeah, it's great to be among such talented authors and fun to meet you all. And happy Valentine's Day to our whole audience. Thank you for the reminder, Miranda. Chin up. I'm at my standing desk, so I can attest to my definitely chin up. Um, so I'm still to introduce myself and introduce Goodbye Orchid, the um, book that launched in October. So I often introduce myself in three ways. I feel like, and probably many of us on the call feel this way, that we're juggling multiple personalities or multiple lives. <laughs> I have my daytime life where I work as a strategist and marketer for Mars Incorporated. So I work in chocolate and I often say it's the sweetest job. And if you cut me, I will probably bleed chocolate, but don't cut me. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> the other part of my life, I have twins at home. I'm also a I'm a reality leader and I serve on a board of directors for a special needs school. In fact, that's where I come from right before this is I was on a board call. And then of course, tonight I'm coming um, to all of you as an author and I'm also a public speaker. I love speaking at writers conferences and helping apply all of the marketing and strategy in my background to helping authors be successful. Mm. And I'm coming tonight as the author of Goodbye Orchid. And I'm really proud to introduce this book to all of you. It's a book of my heart. Absolutely. It's actually inspired by combat wounded veterans. Mm -hmm. And so the journey that the characters go through mirrors that journey of what combat wounded veterans can experience, even though the characters aren't military characters themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you read Goodbye Orchid, first of all, readers say, um, hashtag bring tissues, that it's both oh. <laughs> warming and heart wrenching, um, but in the best possible ways. And so um, in the story, and actually, you know, tonight we're talking about romance. Um, this book is much more of contemporary fiction with romantic elements. It doesn't necessarily fit squarely in the romance genre, but still so perfect for Valentine's Day. Because, um, it comes with an emotionally satisfying ending. So the story is about Phoenix Walker and Orchid Page. Um, Phoenix is a really successful entrepreneur. He started his own ad agency. And when we meet him on page one, actually, the first line of the book is Phoenix never believed today was goodbye because he is falling head over heels for beautiful half Asian Orchid Page. They met through work. They're actually working on pro bono or volunteer work um, through his advertising agency. And he's brought her to the airport for what he thinks is just a six week business trip. But what happens before she's back is a tragic accident befalls Phoenix. And it, when he wakes in the hospital, he finds he's forever changed. He's longing for Orchid, thinking about her, missing her, wanting her by his side, but also remembering that she's had quite a bit of trauma in her own life. She's had a traumatic childhood, lost her parents at an early age, and in the desire to protect her and therefore love her, he feels he's faced with the hardest decision of his life. Whether to love her, he needs to leave her. Mm. And that's the central tension of Goodbye Orchid. 
and why it's called food by orchid. Um, there is one thing I'd love to show you because sometimes it's not immediately obvious. The front cover of the book has shattered orchids on it, which um, represents the emotional and physical shattering of the characters of Phoenix and Orchid. <clears throat> and because that image is so important, that shattering orchid, it's actually also on the bottom corner of every page. So when you flip through oh. the book, there's um, the image of orchids appear to shatter and then come back together. Wow. Oh, like, cool. Oh, that's that's cool. awesome. Subliminals in there. Subliminals. I love that. What a Part neat my, touch. Yeah. And oh, one last thing is just um, my publisher is putting the ebook on sale for Galentine's slash Valentine's Day weekend. So only 99 cents for the ebook this weekend, this Saturday wow. and Sunday. Awesome. Yes. That's go awesome. grab that one, guys. If you haven't read this book, go grab that one. And I love what Annie had to say, but Annie's chiming in. <laughs> As we're talking. I love when she does that. When she was talking about the fact that when you make a huge decision out of love, that is truly romance right there. So, so it absolutely fits with our theme today in every way. Augusta, it is your oh. turn. Tell us all about yourself. Well, I am Augusta Riley. I do have a good background for a change. I get to use my own office where my kids are usually studying. My last interview I did in my closet. <laughs> so I get some peace and quiet. Um, I have been a literary, literally like a literary whore for about 20 years. I didn't that anybody would write me, pay me to write. Um, and I hadn't written, I've got a whole bunch of kids here and I hadn't done any writing for many years and I decided to get back in the game. So I got back up to my old tricks writing really generic, cheesy, boring stuff. Um, but I had this idea that, you know, I'll, I'll write a Hallmark Christmas story slash book. Um, so I started that, getting going with that. And it, you know, it started off a very simple, typical, Hallmark story, small town girl hires a marketing firm to boost her local economy, bring the town back to life. But about 40 pages in, I started to get bored, so I decided she was going to have sex with the marketing team. I watched her go to why I held your hand, and I've gotten a lot of comments that it should be why I held your fill in the blank. So <laughs> oh, I love that. that it turned into. But as you can see, it's a love triangle. Um, there, are, there is an enormous quantity of sex in it, but it's very tasteful. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of sex. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also very sweet. It's not um, cheating, lying. It's a love triangle. It is not a threesome, as some people have, has, have assumed. But um, it felt great, you know, because like everyone else here, you start off young wanting to be a literary giant. You figure out what actually makes you money as, your, as a writer and, you know, life gets real and that's what you start doing. So this is kind of the book where I regained my soul. It's, it's you know, it, it's, it's a generic plot that it started with, but it grew into something bigger. The characters, I think, are likable, hopefully lovable. Um, I know it's, it's obviously a who will she choose, so I don't like to tell too much about it because I don't like well, yeah. the plot. But um, you know, it's, I'm working on the sequel now. Uh, it should be a three book series. Every character is going to get his or her own book. Um, but I, have, like many others here, I'm also a full time accountant slash financial analyst. I, everybody else or some other people have full time jobs, okay. so that keeps me busy. We've got. Five kids here, four at home. So Miranda, I just wanted to let you know on behalf of the rest of us who already have a bunch of kids, kids don't <laughs> stop being a thing. It's more like get them off the pavement and feel good about yourself. That's, that's exactly. what you're going to do, but congratulations. You look Thank very you. happy. You look very pregnant. <laughs> so good for you and keep up the writing and everybody else as well. Perfect. I love it. So cheers to everyone who's working hard and juggling more than they can handle, especially these days. You guys are all doing such amazing things, whether it's, you know, the full-time jobs, the kids, going to have kids, <laughs> getting ready to have kids, all of these things that, that we're all juggling. And I think maybe that's why, you know, I, I feel like 
for me, coming back to the romances and all of that, those are such great escapes from all of the things that are those those trials in our daily life. Even the, the little ones we love so much can some days be a trial. <laughs> they absolutely can. And so, you know, it's, it's great to know that you have this wonderful book that's going to, you know, just reach out and grab you. That's going to take you through all of these emotions and then put you all back together again, kind of like the shattered orchids on the pages that you can kind of dive into. And that's you know a reader's perspective of it. But as, as someone who writes romance and you guys do love stories, it doesn't necessarily have to be romance as much as just love stories and all of those things. What inspires you in you know your lives to to write these stories where do they come from for you how do you decide which love story because there's you know every couple has their own so how do you how do you frame your love stories that you want to put into your books what inspires you it's a free for all y'all just go for it just <laughs> add in <laughs> I'm, not you <laughs> I, I'm happy to share a bit because I, you know, you talked about this idea of escape and I think that is absolutely a benefit. But beyond that, I think also there are deeper human truths and messages in our work that do come from real places in our lives. And I think um, there's really a theme of unconditional love and love conquers all in my work that probably comes from my real life experience in which I met my husband on a train on a 15 minute ride from New York into New Jersey. And he happened to be carrying a book that I wanted to read. And he, within that time we were together, was able to convince me that because he was working in a bookstore, if I simply gave him my address, that he'd be happy to mail me a copy of the book. <laughs> and that led to a series of, once he mailed me the book, I sent him a thank you note. And we have a series of letters that we wrote back and forth to each other when we first met. And I think that kind of real life meet cute and the real life um, love at first sight, honestly, for both of us, it, you know, gives you so much hope and optimism about the power of love. I, I that's absolutely beautiful, Carol. And I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> ride. Right. It's just, it's so, it makes my heart just want to melt into a puddle of chocolate. Um, it feels like it should be a Hugh Grant movie. I mean, am I the only one who thinks you know, this is like right? a Hugh Grant movie? Oh <laughs> no. my goodness. And just have his chiseledness. 90s Hugh Grant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> very much so. Very much so. I have to second that on, and I think that the love stories that I create um, aren't necessarily the meet cute and happily ever after, but they happen to be really neat, cute, and then really wonderful for a short period of time. And then you kind of just close the door and move on. And that was basically my life in my 20s <laughs> as you try to navigate and explore and figure out who you are as an adult um, and potentially an adult post d a divorce um, or a separation or a loss. And, you know, meeting these people and, and dating them and getting to know them and, 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 you know, developing feelings and doing the romance thing and then having to close the door and learning how to close the door amicably and kind and being able to to be, you know, you go into it with respect. Let's end it with respect, and instead of, well, she did this and he did this, and we hate each other now. It was that was what I strive to do in my life, and that it turned out to be, you know, part of my stories and part of my novels. And I think that was the funnest part for me was like, <laughs> I am not dating you because I want to date you. I want to date you for book stuff. <laughs> 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 but like, don't worry. Do you mind if I take notes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, it's funny because you go out for like you go out for supper, and and it's not the first thing that comes up on a first or second date. You know, what do you do? This, this, and this. I have a full time job as well, and and it was like, oh, so what do you write about? I'm like, life, and you know, you have the odd person that's like, you're not allowed to write about me. I was like. <laughs> I'm not going to write about you now that you said that. Like, you, sorry, you're not that special or, or cool. Like, you don't make the cut, bro. Sorry. I did That's like, you know, how did anybody actually go out with Taylor Swift after her first album launched? <laughs> That's a good way to Eyes wide open. <laughs> like, That's a yeah, I think for, for me, 
Um, I'm going to go way, way, way back here to when I was about 17 years old um, and still didn't know much. You know, I had had a, few, a couple of boyfriends that lasted a month or two, but, you know, had never had sex, never had a serious relationship. And I was in some kind of church environment and it was a bunch of us teenage girls sitting around. And for some reason, some old 40 year old lady walked into the room and we allowed her to come in. And even though we were in a church, we were so of course we were talking about sex. And, you know, she put her two cents in and what she had said was, and we, we weren't expecting this. She said, sex is the best thing in the world and it's the closest thing to heaven on earth because you can't get that close to another person any other way here on earth and of course she was talking in very religious terms but you know now that i'm constantly surrounded by teenagers i come back to that a lot a because what that 40 year old old lady said turned out to be true and it was very nice to find that and kids these days i worry so much you know i'm a, i write about sex but i'm also a mom so when i see all the billionaire romances out there and how this what i consider a violation of women you know if, if that's your, how you entertain yourself that's right but it's becoming so mainstream that i worry that kids and young adults are growing up to think this is what sex is so in my book it it actually turned into a little bit of a mission like yeah i was just kind of getting off on it and that's why i was writing all this sex but i actually got kind of uh i really wanted to bring out in these sex scenes sex is an expression of love intimacy is an expression or the culmination of love so what started off you know originally and i think we all do that we want to in a love story you know you're always reaching for the hea for the the, the typical stuff but we want to bring out something deeper too i mean we you can tell the short quick easy story or you can make your character your readers really feel your characters feel them falling in love with one another the best romances I've read are the ones where I'm falling in love mm -hmm. with one of the male leads because they're real. And the ones that just snap, 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 quick, cheap sex or cheap or cheap romance, you know, you can read them to the end and they're fun. But I think as romance writers, yeah. what we really want to do is capture the development of the loving relationship and how lover, lovers express themselves sexually, personally, all different ways. But um, I think that's sort of turned into an inspiration for me and I wasn't aiming for that. We all start writing a book in a certain way and it never really turns out to be what we think it's gonna be on that first 20, 30, 40 yep. pages. So um, to me, that's my kind of inspiration is, I, I don't know if it's an inspiration, it's what I want to bring to my readers. I want them to feel it. I want them to leave the book in love because those are the books that I'm gonna read again and again and again. And that's what I want for my readers. Mm -hmm. I think that's how I felt about the Georgette Hire characters too. Mm -hmm. And it, I was I was falling in love with Sylvester. And you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I will always fall in love with a man who can arch one eyebrow like that's Sylvester. Like his <laughs> thing, that's you know? eyebrow going on. It's, yes, yeah. I mean that was like that's his thing. Like I want someone to look at me that way. You know, I mean it, it's just. You gotta have those characters that do become the book boyfriends. And you know? what's really great is that you can one. write a deep, complex, intellectual character and still make him really good looking. That's <laughs> you have to do both, you know. Get a little bit yes. of everything. Yeah. You must have it all. Yes. <laughs> That's why yes. in your book about boyfriend, you can have it all. Yes. <laughs> right. Y'all are so well spoken. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started reading romance when I was ten. Don't tell my mom. And um, I think one of the reasons I loved it was because I came from a family of, I was, my parents divorced when I was five. And so what I love about romance is no matter what these characters go through, they will end up together. And they always go through a lot of things. And so that was what drove me to read romance and a little bit to write romance. But it took me a couple books to actually figure out what my core story was. They talk about that a lot. Like what is the same story that you talk about over and over again? And for me, that is people finding their place in the world when they don't feel like they fit in very easily. There's something different about them. And gee, I wonder where that came from. I've always felt that way. So it was interesting. You were talking about the expression of love. And one of my little taglines is find yourself in love. So it's about falling in love with the book, but also about love enabling you to figure out more of who you are and how that relates to another person. So, um, 
But I do lots of the, I love the stories where somebody's one or both people, usually both, because we all are, are quirky in some way. So not as well spoken as y'all, but that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine. You're so I rusty. I am you're rusty. not giving yourself nearly enough credit, Margaret. Right. Well, thank you. I'm just rusty, so it's it's a little strange. Nah. <laughs> now you're doing just fine. So Sam, your book has somebody who has to discover themselves as well yeah. as love. So that's an interesting twist on that. Yeah, it's the the I mean the main premise of the book is her finding herself, but she um she, when she initially like leaves a hospital. She ends up, she takes an Uber to her last, um, the last destination she'd gone to. And she assumes that it's, it's her house and she finds a really handsome guy there. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> what a dilemma. <laughs> I know, I know. He doesn't know her from a hole in the ground, but um, he helps her, that's, um, he helps, they, he becomes kind of her sidekick and love interest as throughout the book. So helps her find out who she is and he's, um, He's a, in the, the book, he's a neuroscientist and he's interested in, in studying how people perceive the truth. And, you know, she's a big wow. liar. So there's a... Oh, dang. That's yeah. an interesting angle. I like that. It yeah. is an interesting angle. I mean, it's all an interesting angle. But yeah, it's all it's... angles. <laughs> yeah. I like that combination. That's, that's got to lend itself to some interesting twists along the way. Well, you know, I, think, for him. I think that's what, um, I mean, like in a book for me, like, Rom to build a good romance, you have to have conflict. Otherwise, okay. who gives a crap? No one's going to flip the page because the story's over. So you just want right. to figure out where they where the conflict is, and just <clears throat> dig in through the. I mean, as much as you can through the book. To, I mean, they have to overcome it as they, right. you know, right. <laughs> overcome their internal flaws. Because I mean, the the external problems are usually like surmountable almost immediately if if they're not if they are whole whole people who are you know, able to, you know, like forgive themselves and others and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So. And I think you need good flaws. Yeah. Uh, it, it's right. hard to, yeah, it's hard to relate to a character that's perfect. I mean, those are the ones like, yeah. you know, like you were saying, you each kind of get bored, like, and eh, it's done now. Like, okay, fine. They yeah. have to start with life, this wonderful romance that doesn't happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. So moving on, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's, you've got to have yeah. that conflict and, and that's realistic. We all have that. And I think, in those conflicts, you know, especially as as we get older and we've had you know more relationships, you know, in our rearview mirror, we can see more of our own conflicts in different stories, and we can think, you know, okay, did I handle it that way? <laughs> did I handle it differently? Would I have rather it had gone this way? Or you know, so you you can apply your own conflicts to these stories too, and it, it makes the story more interesting because there's of course that buy-in when you can see yourself in there and we may not be the you know you know i i know i am not the five foot nine 120 pound heroine that is always in these stories <laughs> you know, I'm I'm anymore. a little five foot tall little curvy thing that you know well, the nice thing is they're not always anymore that that was yes. a stereotype from years ago but now mm -hmm. there's representation across the all sorts of different spectrums and that's what mm -hmm. i like Oh yeah, yeah much more relatable. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I'm doing keywords right now on Amazon on search, and I'm a financial analyst, so believe me, I download <laughs> everything and run pivot tables and analysis. And one thing I've been, uh, I have found, is that a lot of the searches that I'm getting hits on have the word curvy in them. Oh so yeah. My character is five foot tall and very buxom, um, but oh, that people are looking for that. What's what I the point is more that people that's are actively searching with the word curves, curvy, right. real women. Uh, and that's really good to know that um, those of us who tip the scales at blah, 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 and have, no, you know, I'm about five, two in my high heels, if I'm lucky. Um, but, you know, to, to see that real women are, you know, coming onto the stage and you don't have to, your characters don't have to be supermodels in order to be readable. And, and men, and men. Yeah. I like, and men I like the good looking dukes. Oh yeah, and I oh, like yes. them. Men hot. But it's also <laughs> nice to have some men with physical flaws as well as the emotional flaws that come with people, because that's reality. 
It is. It makes it more relatable. You get to, mm-hmm. you, you absorb yourself into the character or you picture that, that person, that man that is in the book, you try to relate it to that man that's in your life. And because they have those flaws and then you you know, you see that person in real life and you're like, darn it. I wish you would act like this person that I read about <laughs> this one time. Like, why couldn't you have done that? <laughs> It's also nice. I know that, you know, the hot guy, not necessarily his face, but the hot guy on the book, the cover of the book. (laughs) um, To me, and I know a lot of people are attracted to that, and I don't mind looking at those book covers, but I have my own perfect man in my head. And when I'm reading a character who I'm enjoying, I want to use my imagination. Mm. You know, if you have this hot 22 year old guy with this smoking chest and all this other stuff, he's a college professor. I'm not really buying that. <laughs> <Right. I'm laughs> the, the dark haired man, the little gray on the temples, you know, with the glasses. So it's better in a way because you, you leave it up to your imagination mm-hmm. or to the reader's imagination. They can create that character that you're writing and he's so well-defined or she's so well-defined in your mind, but the reader is is bringing in her own desires and biases into that. And you want her to, le- you want to leave it to her imagination, read the book that she wants to read, the character she wants to read. I love and Carol, this. yours is, yeah, you've got Phoenix who has this major transformation in the book and yet he is still the major love interest and physically there's things that he would need to overcome. So of course he's not fitting our our stereotype that we think about in our romance novels either. Exactly. I think this theme of diversity is amazing that people can see themselves reflected on pages of books and all kinds of diversity. You know, um, we're talking about kind of body size, but also ethnicity and, you know, Goodbye Orchid has actually won nine awards, but the one I'm most proud of is um, the Royal Dragonfly for Disability Awareness because it really reflects and recognizes the work that the book does in terms of diversity. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, congrats. That's special. That is wonderful. And that I think that this is one that um, my daughter who is in college, she's 18, Um, She's a freshman in college, but she is going to be an occupational therapist. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that, I mean, she loves to work with children with disabilities and she wants to be a pediatric occupational therapist, but her heart belongs to those who are overcoming any kind of of disability challenge. And Mm -hmm. I think that this would be something that would really speak to her as a young woman that this is a book, you know, she's not necessarily like me. She's not into the historical romances and things like that. But I believe that Phoenix's story would speak to her as well as Orchid. Um, we come from a family that has, um, I have an aunt who is from Vietnam. I have a sister-in-law who is from Laos. So I have my little nephews are half Asian. And you know, so we've got the diversity in our family as well as that love for those with disabilities. And so I, I really think that this is one that young women who are looking for that type of diversity, that type of, of realistic representation are, are really going to enjoy. And th- that's definitely one that I want to pass on to her because I think that she would she would relate to that so much, just given what her own interests are and her own family, she will see things that that she can pull into that. Whereas, you know, as an 18 year old, you know, she's she's up there with all the college guys and she's going, these guys are idiots. (laughs) 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 You know, they may look good, but she's, they are, you know, what's in there? (laughs) So I think she would enjoy Phoenix's story. (laughs) <laughs> she agrees that you have to let me know what she thinks because there are occupational therapists, physical therapists in there. The research um, that I did with medical professionals was amazing. And I think what's touched me most is people who've been through experiences like Phoenix's and their feedback on Goodbye Orchid is just like so heartwarming. Combat wounded veterans who have read Goodbye Orchid say that not only does it take them back to that moment on the field where they were injured and their recovery period. But they've also told me it gives them additional insight into their own experience because the story is told from multiple points of view. It's not just Phoenix and what he experiences, but also Phoenix's twin, Caleb, Phoenix's mom, Veronica. 
And, and that um, having the multiple points of view actually has had combat wounded veterans tell me they start thinking about what their family members went through when they were injured, which they hadn't really considered before. Mm-hmm. So that's just truly incredible to hear that feedback. Oh, it's that, that, it's, that you know. It's the mm-hmm. ripple effect that happens, right? Mm-hmm. When somebody goes through something, whether it's a, a physical or a mental trauma, it, there's a ripple effect. It, it doesn't only affect that person it's themselves. Right. It affects their caregivers, their loved ones, their family, their friends. I was I, I wrote about PTSD in my third book, um, Just Breathe. It was released last year. And... Um, and, and the ripple effect of the PTSD, I was also diagnosed with PTSD myself. And when the therapist told me, my doctor told me, he's like, yeah, you got post-traumatic stress disorder. I looked at him, I was like, but I don't like guns and I've never been to war before. Like that was my response. And he just, he looked over his glasses and his crazy hair and he has a polka dot vest. And I'm just like, and he looked at me, he says, but you don't have to be. Mm-hmm. To, to have that and it and it didn't occur to me that that was something that was common when there was trauma involved and then as i'm healing and going through it and actually writing my my story you you pick apart your family's brains and get their point of view of the story and their point of view of their experience and then there's this whole shot a shower of guilt that you're like oh my gosh like not only my mental illness is <laughs> now on my mom and dad and my family and friends but you know it's it's this it's being self-aware like going through trauma is not a bad thing like of course it sucks to go through it but to work through it, come out of it, you just become so much more self-aware and I think you become a better person. And and then you're able to relate to a lot more different types of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's just what makes us better humans. Mm -hmm. That's great. Sam, you have a, what, what is the, the, the love interest in yours? Is he a neuroscientist? Did you say? Yeah. Neurosciences. That's another book that my daughter's going to have to read. She's uh, her, OT is a graduate degree, and so she is um, she is biology and psychology major with a neuroscience minor. And so she enjoys looking at how the brain, both psychologically and biologically, talk to itself. <laughs> you know, basically, mm-hmm. you can psychologically tell your brain you know, what you need it to actually physically do and kind of control it that way. And then how both of those two things work together to help or impede the body. And so it's an interesting phenomenon for her to kind of look at all those different side of things. And so she will enjoy seeing those types of careers being represented in in, in books. He might, he'll, she'll like that, that he talks a lot about, um, or the book has a lot about memory and how how it um, works. She'll love that. She will love it. And I love seeing that, you know, the different different careers that you don't typically see in romance books being represented. I mean, they're usually the lawyer, or they're the banker, you know, you, but neuroscience, like, you know, here's a science guy and he's going to be the hottie, you know, I mean, that's, I love that. I love that. I, mean, I have two computer science professors in, in two different books. Yes. So. <laughs> and I'm excited. I'm excited to read um, your Demon Duke book with the the Duke with Tourette's. Tourette's. Thank you. I yeah. just, and I love I love that you have um, representation of disability. I don't know in um, in genre romance, which is I think is harder to sell sometimes. It it can be. Yeah. Uh, I I'm an independently published author. Oh, so there you go. You can you you have free whatever you want. I can do whatever I want to. Yeah. Um, and it came about my son at the time was 14. Yeah. And he one day said to me, Mom, I don't think anybody will ever want me. Oh, <laughs> me. That's so right? sad. It was very sad to me. Um, he has Asperger's and Tourette's, and he was saying, nobody's going to want me. And I kept trying to argue with him, as I always do, that that's not true. But I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to make the Duke be the person who has Tourette's because, you know, Duke's super powerful. Duke. Yes. And um, I'm going to write that for you. Just to you at least have one happy ending that I think you will find too. So has he read the book? No, because mom wrote it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there's a whole story in the back about why I wrote the book. And it's been, it's one of those where I, 
I don't think I would have written it if I didn't have personal experience with it because I wouldn't want to misrepresent something like that. But it's mm -hmm. been very meaningful. And I've gotten, like you were saying, getting communications from people about what it's meant to them to read the book. So that's been a, a bonus to have some people say, I recognized right away what was going on in the book. I have a friend, a colleague, a son, or my husband or whatever has to read. So yeah, it was, but I didn't do it. <laughs> I didn't do it to be hip or whatever. I didn't. Right. Do it. I just dated it. I'm so old compared to the rest of you. Um, I feel like it, but you know, I didn't do it for that reason. I did it for him. Yeah, it was for it was real for you. That's awesome. Very. That's the book of my heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my favorite. I go back to the Georgette hires because that is what I knew my whole life. Because my mom knew that those were romance stories that were clean. <laughs> like, you know, it's okay. I don't you read that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, but, I mean, mom had to stay provided. She took me to the right. library. You know, <laughs> I was like, I this is out. what you can get. And she read them all, so she knew. Uh, but the Dauphin is one that I absolutely loved. And it, it is, you know, I mentioned earlier with Sylvester and the Dauphin, like those are the two that stand out in my memory. And the character of the Dauphin would at the time have been referred to as slow. But when I go back and read it as an adult, this was, you know, a royal with autism. Mm -hmm. And that just was not something that was discussed at the time. But I loved how she painted him in such a positive light as you know, the ones around him accepted him for who he was. They kind of worked with that. They understood it. The main characters who's kind of circle, you know, circling this, this character are, are acceptant of him. And he was not one who wasn't like the crazy kid that got shoved up in the attic, like mm -hmm. so many books at the time would have done. But I love the respect that she showed to him. And because of that, you know, that was not a book that it was because, you know, somebody like me that I'm, Obviously, I have a lot of um, interest in those with special needs as well. I actually was a special ed teacher for a while, too. And, you know, if that had been disrespected in any way, it would not have been one of those books that, that stuck with me like that. Right. But that character and the way that it was represented um, was a very positive thing. And I was glad to see that as a young reader. And... You know, if you are going to have readers of you know young women who are reading these books, young men, you know, who knows, who are reading these books, you want them to see those things that you're representing in the light in which you intend. And so it's nice to see the diversity and the representation and you know the openness about what love can be, what it can be with, a, you know, a wide range of people. It is, it's not this cookie cutter thing that you know Hollywood would make it out to be. It's it's nice to see that it is it is as real as everybody around us. And it's just a matter of finding the one that is right for you, wherever that person is and whenever that person is. <laughs> Who knows where they're gonna be with Margaret's books. They could be That's true. You know, hundred years on either side of you. Right. You just don't know. <laughs> you You're reminding know. me. <clears throat> I had dinner with a friend last night who was a teenage son and he has um he's he has autism. And at the dinner table, he said to his mom, mom, am I going to be a 40 year old virgin? <laughs> now, I realize the advice I need to give her is to have her give him one of these romance novels that you're talking about, Nola. I love it. <laughs> they're there. I mean, and I love that the representation is out there for these people to see that those happily ever afters belong to them too. They absolutely belong to them too. Yeah. And that, the relationship is layers of intimacy. It is layers of acceptance. It is layers of love and varying, you know, stages and degrees and all of them build on each other. And so you find the one that is right for you and all of those layers start to appear. And it, it's a great thing to, to have that across this particular genre and, and to see that that is changing from the cookie cutter stereotypes that we've seen for so much of the time. So uh, we are, we could talk about this for days. I mean, <laughs> I'm enjoying the heck out of this, but I'm going to tell you a story about a lady who found lots of love, but maybe not the one mm -hmm. <laughs> in our New Orleans mystery and history segment here. We are going to talk about the tomb of Josie Arlington. Here is Miss Josie here. She was born in 1864 as Mamie Dubler. Of course, she didn't like that name. She grew up in a New Orleans suburb with very strict parents. She grew up in Carrollton. At the age of 17, she took up with a pimp and gambler named Philip the Schwartz Lebrano. She came home late 
for curfew one night. Her parents, these strict parents, remember, refused to let her in the house. She banged on the door, she yelled, she screamed, she cried, she cussed, and they would not let her in. And so she stomped away, never to return to their house or that neighborhood ever again. After spending two nights on the street, little Mary, as she was known, moved in with Lebrano and became known as Josie Arlington. Now, Josie, of course, was taken up with pimp, right? So it wasn't long before Josie realized that she could make more money on her feet than on her back. From 17 to 24, she was she was hooking for Lebrano. Uh, but then she decided that she and Lebrano needed to open up a brothel of their own. The first one may have failed miserably because she had a bunch of rowdy girls and the big <laughs> fight broke out in which one of those, those fights, her brother was shot, was wounded, not killed, but he was shot and uh, decided that was enough of that one. Uh, so they closed that one up. And they opened a new one on Basin Street. And here's a shot of Basin Street a long time ago there for you. And she had a great success with this one because she claimed royalty was part of her house there. The girls that worked for her, she dressed them up in French lingerie. She claimed to have a baroness and other European elite. The girls were really just girls nobody in the town had seen because they came from Baton Rouge and Biloxi and she told them to keep their mouths shut <laughs> so that they wouldn't know that they were just from other parts of the South. <laughs> um, so Josie and her royal ladies um, went on to cater to the lust of the New Orleans elite and she built quite a bit of wealth and power in doing this, uh, not only in the money that she held, but the secrets she held as well. She kept them all in a book. And Josie and her little book of secrets um, kept sway over much of the the powerful in New Orleans. She used those secrets for legal favors, police protection, and even more. She wanted desperately to be part of New Orleans high society and yet was never accepted into that. Even when she bought a mansion on Esplanade, um, neighbors just snubbed her. So she never really got that acceptance that she wanted. However, in death, she got the last laugh. <laughs> Josie went and bought a very expensive burial plot for herself. And when she died, she was buried among the elite who snubbed her in Metairie Cemetery. She died at the age of 50 on Valentine's Day. And of course, that is why she's our feature story today, 1914. And here she had this gorgeous tomb constructed with twin stone flames that towered over the other tombs at the time. So she lifted herself up a bit higher than those who put her down. Now it's the flames in the statue of what is assumed to be Josie that still cause eyebrows to raise in this city today. So the flames atop the tomb are occasionally seen flickering red at night. Large mm -hmm. crowds flock to see the red light district madam's red flames to the point where the swaying street light that was blamed for the phenomenon had to be removed <laughs> to stop the crowds from coming. However, the flames can still be seen glowing red, even though the large trees block any of the surrounding streetlights that may be casting the glow on them. Also, two grave diggers have reported more than once that the statue itself of Josie mm -hmm. walks among the tombs of the cemetery at night, and it has actually been found in various places throughout the cemetery in the morning. Mm -hmm. Spooky. Yes. So why do you ask that the statue wanders at night. Well, here's why. Look closely at the name on the tomb. It says J.A. Morales, not Josie Arlington. Huh. J.A. does not stand for Josie Arlington. On her death, Josie left her house and wealth to her niece and her business partner. The two were secretly lovers. They soon blew through Josie's fortune and sold everything, including the house and finally her tomb. <gasps> Josie's remains were moved to make way for the new owners. So there is loud banging on the doors at night that will disturb the residents in the surrounding neighborhood. And they all say that it is assumed to be the famous madam demanding entry into her tomb. So that is a story <laughs> of Miss <laughs> Josie <laughs> Arlington. <laughs> The Brian. New Orleans Madam, <laughs> the famous oh, Josie Arlington. Yeah. Yes, that was fun. Cemetery. Creepy. 
I have to go pick someone up from play practice. So I'm going to bug out. It's been lovely talking to you ladies and meeting everybody. Great, uh, great time. Good luck with all your books. And Nola, thank you for having me. You are so welcome. You are welcome. All right, we are going to wrap up here just a little bit today. I'm going to do a little special something before I tell you goodbye. We talked just a little bit, but Annie always fusses that I don't promote my own work enough. So here we go. Here is the book trailer for Crescent City Moon, the first in the Crescent City series. There you go. Good work. There's my blood. <laughs> yeah. How do you pronounce her name, Nola? How do you pronounce do her name? No, oh, Zaley. 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 Yep. Zaley. Awesome. All right. So if you like that, here's some more books you might like. Probably more Valentine's reads than that one. <laughs> Although there's a little, there's some romance in there. There's the cute officer that's helping her out. Mm -hmm. um, here's some great books for you to check out for your Valentines. These are all fantastic. Of course, we have got uh, Darren's book on here as well, The Queen of Tuesday. We're sorry that he couldn't join our fantastic conversation tonight, but do please check out his book with the fabulous Lucille Ball in it as well. These are all great choices for your Valentine's weekend reading. And I am so grateful for all of you for spending your evening with me tonight. It has been truly a joy talking love stories, romance, and all things love with all of you. And all of you in the comments, thank you so much for leaving comments. I've, I've been watching them, but we've had so much going on <laughs> than talking that I didn't get as many of them up there as I like to do. Um, so I'll be going back and checking those. And for those of you who did not get to see the show from the beginning, or if you've missed it entirely or missed some past episodes, you can always go to Nola Nash Entertainment on YouTube. That is where all the past episodes of the Second Line show live. So catch up from episode one. This is episode 18. You've got quite a bit of viewing. You can catch up on to some great stories there from some great authors spanning Gosh, I guess since probably May we've been doing this. We've been doing quite a few of them, and there's some great special events in those um, episodes as well. So tune in there. And thank you all so much for joining us. It has been truly a joy. And happy Valentine's Day to each and every one of you. All right. And here's our last little bump of video. Bye.